Well, that then brings us to this evening's lecture. Could I welcome our, our uh, speaker, Professor Michael Barrett, uh, Professor of Biochemical Parasitology at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Michael uh, is a biochemical parasitologist um, applying uh, metabolics uh, to learn about parasite biology. He is a huge enthusiast of his subject, as you will learn, and also a huge enthusiast um, of the history of the subject, and therefore I think has welcomed the opportunity of paying tribute to Dr. David Livingston this evening, and we look forward very much indeed to that. So with that, uh, that's really all of my introductory remarks. Um, let me pass over now to Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir John, and thank you very much um, both for my um, inauguration into the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which I am uh, duly proud, um, but also for inviting me along this evening to uh, discuss Dr. David Livingstone, because today is the 200th anniversary of Livingstone's birthday, and I think as we are speaking here, um, there's a service going on in Westminster Abbey to celebrate Livingstone's uh, life and there have been many events across Scotland um, and the United Kingdom today as well as across many parts of Africa where Livingstone travelled. I thought what I would do because it's um, pertinent to the Royal Society um, of Edinburgh is to focus about some of Livingstone's scientific achievements but to put those within the context of his life more generally. And because my own scientific interests are around tropical diseases, I will also put more emphasis on his contribution and his understanding of tropical medicine and his um, fantastic efforts there. Livingstone, when he was born, lived in a time when a map of Africa was largely like this. Europeans who drew maps were able to appear at the coast, and there are a variety of towns on the coast, but the interior of Africa was largely unknown. And it was largely unknown because those European mappers couldn't make it into the interior, <laughs> not for the most part uh, because of some of the fearsome animals with which we are familiar from that continent, but actually more than anything due to some of the tiny animals present on that continent, most notably the Anopheles mosquito, which is, we now know, but nobody knew back then, is responsible for the transmission of parasites that cause malaria. And today malaria still afflicts um, over 300 million people the world over, and over half a million people, mainly children, die from malaria every year still and that's a child every minute of every day is dying from this disease, malaria. What Livingstone didn't know, but what we know now, is that malaria is caused by parasites. These are some parasites, or depictions of parasites, bursting out of red blood cells within our bloodstream, which happens periodically depending upon the strain of malaria that you have. So Livingstone went out to Africa and essentially walked for 30,000 miles across that continent over 30 years. And Livingstone is probably one of the most astonishing figures in the history of humanity based on his incredible feats of endurance. He was born near Glasgow in the village of Blantyre into a mill, and this is the mill house which is still there and is now the Museum of African Exploration which celebrates Livingstone's life and although this looks like a rather large house Livingstone plus his four siblings and two parents all dwelt within a single room probably about as large as this stage. Whilst he was there from the age of 10 he went to work in the mill from 6 in the morning till 8 in the evening and after his work in the mill, he came back and spent two hours at school. And after two hours at school, he read until midnight, 
before waking up at six o'clock the next morning to get back into the mill to work again. And that was truly astonishing. This was a time when few people of Livingstone's background would have conceived of receiving an education. Not only was he able to get a, an education, the mill in which he worked was relatively enlightened for those times, just 14 hours a day for 10-year-old boys in there, um, but actually encouraged the education. Livingston became very interested in science. He spent a lot of time among the banks of the River Clyde, which runs behind Blantyre. He found fossils. He looked at the flora and the fauna. He wanted to become a scientist, but his father wouldn't let him because he was a devout um, evangelist, religious um, preacher, and could not reconcile himself with a child growing up to learn the sciences. Eventually, through all of his readings, Livingstone came across a book called The Philosophy of a Future State by Thomas Dick, who is an eccentric scientist from Broughty Ferry. And uh, in The Philosophy of the Future State, Thomas Dick was able to reconcile science with religion as two different mechanisms of ultimately looking for the same truth. Armed with this information, Livingston was able to persuade his father that he should be able to go and learn science, but particularly through medicine. The idea being that if he learned medicine, he would be able to use that medical training as a missionary to save the heathen of the planet. And eventually his father agreed, and Livingston went to the Anderson University in Glasgow, which has since then transformed into the University of Strathclyde in order to take um, lectures in different aspects of medicine, including chemistry, anatomy, uh, materia medica. And he eventually qualified. Um, he attended his lectures. He then spent a couple of years down in London um, with the London Missionary Society learning theology and also attending lectures at Charing Cross and Moorfields Hospital, eventually coming back to Glasgow, where he was able to sit an exam at the Royal College of Surgeons and Physicians and receive a license enabling him to practice medicine. He met some very influential people during his medical years, including James Young, who's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And Young was probably the world's first oil man. And Young developed a technique for removing oil from shale found in the shale stones beneath uh, much of West Lothian. And actually, if you travel around West Lothian, you'll frequently find these great uh, man-made orange hillocks, which are the leftovers of the shale from which the oil had been extracted. And the most famous are the Five Sisters shale beings in West Lothian, ironically enough, near the town which today is called Livingston. Whilst at the London Missionary Society, Livingston met Sir Robert Moffat, who was to later become his father-in-law. Livingston had initially thought he would go to China to um, work as a missionary, but actually at that time, China was engaged in the Opium Wars with Britain, and Moffat recommended instead going to Southern Africa, where he believed the population was ready um, for conversion to Christianity. And Livingstone sailed to Southern Africa and from Cape Town went to this very pleasant missionary station that Moffat has set up in Kuruman, which is in the north of South Africa. Eventually, Livingstone moved north to set up his own missionary and in Kolobeng, and um, while he was there, he taught the locals agriculture and other skills such as lion hunting. And unfortunately for Livingstone, he was famously attacked by a lion during this time and describes himself as having been tossed around by the lion in the same way as a dog would toss around a small toy. And he broke his arm and survived, but he went back to Kuruman and there he met Moffat's daughter Mary who nursed him back to health and they married. Once married, Livingston didn't settle. He decided to keep moving north into different parts of southern Africa and would frequently bring Mary along with him. Uh, famously, he crossed the Kalahari Desert initially with some other traveling colleagues, and then eventually, as you can see here, he brought his family with him to Lake Ngami. And that was his first major discovery, this lake 
just north of the Kalahari Desert, a huge space of water at the time. And of course, this was terribly important because just beyond the Kalahari, there were huge reserves of water. And in terms of Livingstone's ultimate ambition of trying to bring people into Africa to for, to, for agricultural purposes, the discovery of large tracts of water was quite important. And for this and his other discoveries, which came later on that first expedition, um, he was awarded the Royal, the Royal uh, Geographical Society's gold medal by another fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Sir Roderick Murchison, who was also president of the Royal Geographical Society and actually became a very powerful and influential friend of Livingston, who helped him through many of his um, expeditions later in life. If we look at Livingston's travels, so he came from southern Africa initially to um, the area around modern-day Botswana. And it was actually from here that he decided he would try to find a route whereby Scots um, agriculturalists would be able to make it into Central Africa, where he believed the land was sufficiently fertile that were it properly tended to agriculturally would enable fantastic productivity. The trouble was coming up from the Cape, crossing the Kalahari Desert he saw as being a no-hoper at that time. He then sent his wife and family back to the UK, and we won't labor on that, but it was actually very difficult for his wife, who had been born and raised in Southern Africa, to come and live in Scotland, as I think we can all see today why there are great differences there. Um, but having sent his family back to the UK, Livingston then decided he needed to find other routes by which Europeans could come into Central Africa. And he walked uh, from Linianti to Luanda on the Angolan coast. And he decided, however, having suffered from scores of bouts of malaria himself during this time, that that wasn't going to be a very good route in. He was nearly dead when he arrived in Luanda. He could have got a boat back to the UK at that time, but he didn't. He decided he would walk back again, partly because he was unconvinced that this was the route, and also he had promised um, Chief Sekalete that he would bring the porters that he'd given him back to Linianti, and he was good to his word. So he walked all the way back again, and whilst he was here, he decided that probably it would make sense to just check out the other route, if that was going to offer a better way in. And that's precisely what he did. Uh, he walked all the way from west coast to east coast, making fantastic discoveries en route, befriending many Africans, Chief Sechelet. Um, this individual became very important in the setting up of modern-day Botswana. And his great claim to fame was he was the only African that Livingston, the missionary, converted to Christianity. And even then, it wasn't a terribly good conversion, because although Sechelet was pleased to say that he was converting to Christianity and was pleased to receive weapons and the like and the protection of Livingston, um, he found it relatively difficult to give up on all of his five wives and um, was therefore considered a convert, but only a partial convert. <laughs> Livingston reckoned that the Zambezi River was the answer. You see, walking across Africa was very tough. As we'll see later, it was very difficult to take horses and other animals, beasts of burden across. Rivers, he thought, were the answer. There were no railroads in those times. There were no roads. You were walking through very tough terrain and jungle. The Zambezi River, Livingston was convinced, would be the way in. He therefore walked down the banks of the Zambezi River and en route came across the Victoria Falls. And this, at the time, was known as Mosi Oatanyi, the smoke that thunders because of the noise it made and the spray that was coming up you could see for miles around. And again, this was considered one of Livingston's great discoveries. Um, of course, it's very contentious as to whether it's truly a discovery, given that there were hundreds of tribesmen living nearby who discovered it every morning. But what Livingstone did do was to bring to the eyes of Europeans these sensational features that we found out. And he was a scientist. He didn't just look at these things. He wondered about them. How wide was this magnificent waterfall? How deep was it? And he crawled out onto a place called Livingstone's Island, and he took a piece of rope and he dipped it down the falls and we could later measure it. He could see that it was over 100 meters long, deep 
and over a mile wide. And actually, Livingston, we can't nowadays, I think, appreciate how important his geographical discoveries were with a sextant, with the stars. If you read his missionary travels, he would go around and make very precise measurements of exactly where different places were within Africa. And it was fantastically important in those times because he was drawing these observations onto a moonscape. And he was very precise in those measurements as a scientist. So eventually he made it back to the East Coast. And from the East Coast, he got back to the United Kingdom. And if we look, take a break here and look at Livingston's background, he studied medicine in Scotland, Anderson's College. He went down to England to study theology. He sailed to distant lands and made very impressive notes on the fauna, the flora, and the local geographical discoveries. And as he was doing this, he was sending dispatches back to Richard Owen at the Natural History Museum, um, William Hooker at Kew, and Roderick Murchison. He was reporting his discoveries to these great members of the British scientific establishment. He was also becoming increasingly interested in the slave trade, which he saw as the biggest impediment to anything within Africa. And of course, in the late 1850s, he published his defining book, The um, Missionary Travels and Researches in South Africa. So this is a brief biography of David Livingston, and exactly the same biography from exactly the same time period would also refer to Charles Darwin, um, who studied medicine in this city, who moved to Cambridge to study theology. He went to South America rather than to Africa, although he did pass by Cape Town on the way back. He was corresponding with exactly the same people that Livingston was corresponding with. He was also fascinated by the slave trade, and it seems that Darwin probably began to think about the origin of species and common descent, not looking at wild animals in South Africa, but because of his upbringing with Sir Joshua Wedgwood being his paternal grandfather, abolitionism was very important in the Darwin household. And lots of Darwin's writings show that he was trying to make a point that black people and white people were all people at a time when some slavers were of the opinion that these should be considered as different species. So this thinking about similar origins, common origins, was permeating all of Darwin's thinkings. And of course, it was in 1858 that uh, The Origin of the Species was published by John Murray in London as well. And as we think about some of Darwin's famous observations, his finches, the evolutionary origins, so we can look at things like Livingstone's Turaku, which was a bird found in Africa. It's actually named after um, Livingstone's brother rather than Livingstone himself. And Livingstone made many huge discoveries in natural history. He discovered or described for the first time dozens of species of mammal. He was very interested in this organism, the honey guide, which he discovered um, as flying to people, irritating them, flying on a few trees further, and having the people follow them. And what the honey guide does is it gets people to follow them to a bee's nest. And it realizes that upon discovering the bee's nest, the people will take the bee's nest down to get their share of the honey, and the honey guide can deal with the leftovers. So it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. And Livingston's writings are full of these sorts of commensalism which are occurring on the plains of Africa. And his books are replete with these incredible descriptions of the natural history of Africa at that time. The extraordinary thing is, and again, an important part of Livingstone persona, is that in spite of all he was seeing in Africa, when specifically asked what he thought of Darwin's theory, said that he'd actually seen no evidence for the struggle of existence on the African plains, which is completely contradictory to many of his writings where he recognizes that lions will predate upon the weakest members of a herd of antelope. And yet, Livingston was above all a Christian, and he could not reconcile the idea of evolution and all that it entailed against the idea of God the Creator. So he was able to make fantastic observations. 
and yet he was equally able to ignore his own observations because he was so stubborn and insistent upon Christianity and God as a creator. He made very, very important discoveries in medicine, including the fact that this tick, tampan tick, once it bit people, uh, was able to cause relapsing fever. Not a simple malarial fever, but a much more serious and uh, constantly relapsing fever. This is probably the first description of an arthropod transmitting a disease. And after Livingstone, a whole series of Scottish investigators in particular were able to show the link between other biting arthropods and diseases. Sir so Patrick Manson is actually a distant relative of Livingston, and he came from Old Meldrum. And Manson um, moved out to the Far East and was very interested in the disease that we know today as lymphatic filariasis, or sometimes elephantiasis, because of the symptoms of the disease, which include a profound thickening of the skin and often a profound swelling of the extremities. And it was known prior to Manson that this disease was associated with finding tiny filarial worms in the bloodstream and lymphatics. But how did that disease transmit between people? And Manson was able to show that it was through the bite of mosquitoes that one person could become infected from another. And this is directly related to Livingston having shown that the tampon tick was responsible for relapsing fever. Manson then directly encouraged another physician scientist of Scottish descent, Sir Ronald Ross, the first British winner of a Nobel Prize, to show that malaria was also transmitted by mosquitoes. So Manson had this fantastic correspondence with Ross. Ross had come and said, look, you know, Man Ross was a phenomenal figure. He was, he was in the British Army. He was a scientist, he was a medic, he was a fantastic sportsman, he was a novelist, he was a mathematician, he was a playwright and a poet. Um, and he told Manson that he got bored <laughs> during his nights in India. So Manson said, well, what you could do is just go and show that malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. So night after night after night after night, Ross, having done all of his other um, business during the day, would collect mosquitoes and using this microscope uh, and anybody who's had the pleasure of looking through a microscope like that would realize that the magnification isn't very impressive but night after night he was collecting mosquitoes of many species and dissecting them and eventually he showed that malaria type parasites could be found within the Anopheles type of mosquito and was then able to connect malaria transmission with mosquitoes and that's phenomenally important. It's phenomenally important because we didn't know what caused malaria at this time, or the parasites had been discovered, but we couldn't really have much by way of rational intervention. I'll come on into a minute on some of the drugs that were available. But knowing that mosquitoes transmit these parasites means that there's something tangible that we can see and we can interfere with to stop malaria being transmitted. So these discoveries that mosquitoes were responsible for transmitting disease enabled huge interventions. People could sleep under mosquito nets to stop getting malaria. You could drain swamps in which mosquitoes bred in order to get rid of malaria. And huge um, progress was made in the war against malaria following from Ross's discovery. Now, Livingston himself was able to survive in Africa where every previous European explorer had failed because he'd read from William's Niger expedition that by taking this compound called quinine, which was the product of a Peruvian tree bark, you could cure yourselves of African fever. And as a doctor, he tried it and it worked. And he was able to take notes. How much quinine should he take? Well, he took enough to cause a ringing in the ears, a thing we call chinchinism now, which was considered to be the correct amount to take. And in fact, Livingston also read and saw from his own autopsies that frequently patients who died of the fever, we now know to be malaria, had deep tar-like deposits within their um, blood vessels. And what Livingstone came up with was a formulation of quinine 
plus rhubarb, um, jalap, calomel, which had purgative actions. And he thought it was really actually clearing the system um, through regular bowel movements that somehow quinine was also contributing to that was responsible. We now know that actually the quinine was the right bit and the, cal the calomel, rhubarb, and jalap were completely unnecessary. Um, nevertheless, uh, Livingstone's rousers, as they were called, were marketed by Burroughs Welcome for many years. And this, by the way, is a, is, um, a cast of Livingstone's broken arm from the lion attack. Um, this was from the uh, David Livingstone Center down in Blantyre. William Leishman from Glasgow discovered parasites um, called Leishmania parasites, and another Scot, um, Henry Short, showed that these were also transmitted by sand flies. So we could go and go on and on and on, and hopefully, if um, anybody who hasn't, there are some booklets on the Scottish encounter trop of tropical disease which will give you some background into all of these great discoveries by Scots physicians. If you look at Livingstone's first and most famous book, Missionary Travels, on the front piece, we can see what perhaps he considered to be the two most important discoveries from his first trip. One was the Victoria Falls, this great geographical discovery that brought him fame. But the other is a fly, the tsetse fly. And the reason that the tsetse fly made it onto the front cover was that Livingstone saw this beast, it's about as big as a blue bottle, but with a nasty probing proboscis. Livingstone saw this fly as the single most important barrier to European colonization or entrance into Africa. And the reason for that was, and the reason why Livingstone walked everywhere, was that whenever a domestic animal was bitten by a tsetse fly, it would become hugely emaciated and then die. So cattle, horses, dogs, goats, and so on. He also knew that wild animals didn't die when bitten by tsetse flies. But he really thought that because it was more or less impossible to tame the wild animals, to get them to carry carts for him, um, and because it was far better to have agriculture involving the domesticated species, he thought that getting rid of the tsetse fly would be crucial. We now know that Livingstone didn't know. Livingstone thought that the tsetse fly was perhaps injecting some kind of venom like snake venom. We now know that what tsetse flies actually inject into you when they bite you are tiny parasites called trypanosomes, which will swim around in the bloodstream, and in the case of a human disease we call sleeping sickness, eventually invade the brain. It was another Scot, Sir David Bruce, who showed that the trypanosome was responsible for the human disease called sleeping sickness. Um, Bruce had previously shown in southern Africa that these parasites were responsible for the cow disease that was known as Livingston's fly disease. And then in the early 20th century, he was sent up to Uganda and was able to show that these parasites were responsible for human disease there as well. These are some of Bruce's pictures of the trypanosome parasites. Livingston never saw human African trypanosomiasis. And we think that's because in eastern and southern Africa, a variant of the parasite which normally infected cattle gained the ability to infect people. The areas in which Livingston was traveling prior to that evolutionary event in these parasites did not have human African trypanosomiasis. And Livingston noted that. He noted that although domestic animals were killed by tsetse bites, humans never were, and wild animals never were. And I won't labor on this, but we now know a great deal about what happens here. This is a trypanosome, and it turns out probably through human evolution, humans evolved in Africa in the area of trypanosomes, is that humans were able to evolve because we have a protein which is lytic to these trypanosomes. And we now know that humans have a protein, nothing to do with our immune system, which is able to kill trypanosomes. And it's called the trypanosome lytic factor. And here's a parasite. And what happens is this trypanosome lytic factor, it's part of our lipoprotein component of blood, gets into these parasites, gets inside their system and kills them. What seems to have happened probably around the turn of the 19th, 20th century is one trypanosome in Eastern Africa evolved a protein 
which was able to bind to and neutralize this lytic factor, meaning that these parasites, which previously had only been able to survive in animals, were now able to survive in humans as well. So we saw these epidemics of sleeping sickness in Eastern and Southern Africa after Livingstone's time. What Livingstone did note was that buffalo in particular were highly resistant to trypanosomes. And what Livingstone didn't know at that time was that trypanosomes were even responsible for the death. But again, just to show some interesting research that's been done re in recent years, is that it's now been shown that African Cape buffalo have an enzyme in their blood called xanthine oxidase, which turns one chemical into another. And as it does that, it produces this compound, which is hydrogen peroxide, which is highly toxic. Now, we produce hydrogen peroxide all the time. All animals do. But we normally deal with our own hydrogen peroxide production by an another enzyme called catalase, which breaks it down to water and oxygen. What's been shown recently is that Cape buffalo turn their own catalase off when they become infected with trypanosomes, which mean that they keep their hydrogen peroxide levels unnaturally high for long enough them to kill the parasites. Subsequently, a new mechanism kicks in in order to keep the parasites at bay. But we now have a mechanism which describes why the Cape buffalo were resistant to trypanosomes Livingstone knew nothing about the biochemistry or even the microbiology of those infections, but he did know that Cape buffalo were resistant to trypanosomiasis. And based on that information, and because he knew from trips to India, the Indian buffalo were much easier to tame than African buffalo, and you could use them to carry carts. Actually, before his last expedition to Africa, he stopped off in India, in Bombay, and he bought some Indian buffalo back with him. And this is great Livingstone's thinking processes. Buffalo resist trypanosomiasis. <laughs> buffalo can be used to pull carts, but not the African ones. They're too wild. Let's get some Indian ones. He bought them. He bought them back with him. And the bad news was that actually the Indian buffalo doesn't have the same mechanism of protecting against trypanosomiasis. And it was a, a fruitless, but again, it's all about Livingstone's scientific method as he was always trying find ways of beating the terrain set against him in Africa. Anyway, after that first expedition, Livingstone came back to London, to the United Kingdom. He published his book, Missionary Travels, and he became a phenomenally famous man. And the timing was perfect for him. The timing was perfect because this was the time of expansion of the British Empire. His adventures were fantastic. He wrote so well. The vivid descriptions of what was happening in Africa were um, incredibly interesting to most of the public. And he went around the country. He was made a freeman of many cities, including Glasgow. He met the Queen. He met the Prime Minister. And he was convincing the British population that what was needed was to go into Africa to bring trade, commerce, Christianity, and civilization to this part of the world for two purposes. One was to ameliorate the plight of the African which he saw as being particularly wretched, and it was. I think sometimes we think of this African idyll of unspoiled villages and this fabulous countryside and so on and so forth. The reality was, as Livingstone was seeing, was there were horrors occurring in Africa at the time. The slave trade, the Arab slave trade, the Portuguese slave trade was running out of control. Villagers were fighting against villages, killing people, slaughtering people to capture slaves. Famine was everywhere. The ground wasn't being particularly well cultivated. Tropical diseases were everywhere. Livingstone believed that if Europeans came into Africa, not as imperial colonizers, but as people to integrate within those societies, everybody was going to benefit. And in order to encourage the government, he persuaded them that there would be fantastic profits to be made for the United Kingdom as well. There were mineral resources, coal, diamonds, gold, agriculture, cotton. So he persuaded the government that he should carry out a second expedition specifically to look and see how easily it would be to navigate the Zambezi River to bring Europeans and trade into Africa. Unfortunately, on his great trans-African journey, he'd failed to notice the Kebrabassa rapids, these 
rapids in this deep gorge which made the river completely unnavigable. It was a disaster. It meant that you couldn't bring steamships up this river, you couldn't come in from the coast into the highlands that he'd seen as inhabitable. Many people would have given up at this point. Livingston didn't. Um, this, by the way, is John Kirk, who is another Scot who joined the expedition as a medic and also an economic botanist. Kirk made fantastic notes on the flora, the fauna, the tsetse fly. He had incredible notes on the tsetse fly, which may have brought our understanding of Trypanosomiasis forward by two decades, had Livingstone not insisted that they keep on trying to navigate these Kebrabassa rapids. <laughs> Kirk couldn't believe it. They were just not navigable. Livingston had promised the United Kingdom that they were. Kirk said, let's not do it, but no, let's try, 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 and try again, which is what Livingston always did. And sadly, all of Kirk's notes and specimens were lost um, in the Kebrabassa Rapids. Eventually, Livingston realized that you couldn't do the Kebrabassa Rapids, but he found a tributary to the Zambezi called the Shiri River. And eventually they went up the Shiri River. They couldn't do the whole river. There were also rapids and marshes and difficult parts, but finally reached Lake Nyasa, or Lake Malawi, as we call it today. And Livingstone was convinced that this would be an easier place to reach than the previous highlands. And therefore, he sent dispatches to say, we should come, we should bring missionaries into this area, the Shiri Highlands in one day Malawi. The bad news was that famine, drought, cholera were spreading down Eastern Africa at this time, and slaving was becoming ever increasingly popular as an economic activity. The first missionaries who began to respond to Livingston's calls to come to Africa arrived, but they were not Livingston, they weren't medics. And in fact, some of them, it seems, it's almost when you read it, thought they were on some sort of um, church Sunday afternoon jaunt. And they arrived in Africa without any precautions against fever and malaria. And one by one, these families were being picked off individuals by malaria. They were dying. And Livingston was ultimately responsible. He was the one who'd encouraged them to come there. He became more and more detached as he felt more and more guilty because he hadn't encouraged them to take quinine. He thought they would just take it. They didn't. So all of the missionaries who were coming out were dying, and even his wife, Mary, arrived. She was missing him desperately back from the UK. Eventually, she came across to join him on the Zambezi. She got so ill that she couldn't even keep down the quinine that she was taking, and eventually Mary also died from malaria and is buried by the banks of the Zambezi River. So the Zambezi was considered a fiasco, the expedition. It had all gone wrong. And Livingston was profoundly ashamed. He actually still believed, and ironically, 10 years after Livingston had died, Malawi was proving to be a very popular and useful destination for missionaries and settlers to come into southeastern Africa. But the expedition was recalled. Livingstone came back to the United Kingdom, and having previously come back a hero, he now came back a villain. In the meantime, African exploration had become all the rage. A number of other great explorers were also pouring into Africa to see if they could make great discoveries along the lines of Livingstone. And two of the most famous were John Hanning Speak and Richard Burton. And they had several um, trips out into Africa looking specifically for the source of the Nile. And they fell out. And they fell out because they were competing for the rival claims for the source of the Nile. And the Nile had become so important for two reasons. One is it was the biblical river. And by this time, the British, with its empire, the British people were considering themselves to be God's people. And it seemed anathema not to be able to know where the Nile arose from. Livingston was also pragmatic. Remember, he was trying to look for highways into the center of Africa. Could you navigate the Nile? Could you come all the way from Europe, across the Mediterranean, through the Nile, into Central Africa? That would solve everything. So Livingstone decided he would also look for the source of the Nile. And actually, he was sent to chair a debate between Speke and Burton 
in Bath at the meeting of the Royal Society of the um, um, the uh, Science Academy. What are they called? Can't, I'll, I'll tell you after. But as he was there, um, Speak shot himself accidentally on a hunting um, foray just before the meeting, and Murchison said, "We need to find this." There's only one person who can tell us where the source of the Nile is, and that's the great Dr. Livingstone. Livingstone was, again, an avid reader, and he'd read the ancient works of Ptolemy, the Egyptian, who reckoned that the Nile's source was deep in Africa, arising from four fountains, further south than some of the other lakes. And that made sense to Livingstone, because during his previous expedition, he'd been down to some of the lakes in Zambia modern-day Zambia, and he thought that they were really where the Nile was coming from. So Burton reckoned the source of the Nile was Lake Tanganyika, and he was wrong. Speak thought it was Lake Victoria, and he's ultimately right. It's actually from the ruins, the Ruanzuri Mountains um, in Rwanda into Lake Victoria and up there. But Livingstone thought that the Nile may come all the way to Lake Banguelo in modern-day Zambia. And that's what he set out to prove on his final expedition. During this time, the last seven years of his life, he didn't have much money. He couldn't raise the government money that he'd raised previously. And he spent a lot of time walking between villages, between lakes, along rivers, trying to track them to see where was the most southernmost point of water which he would be able to then follow forward into what he hoped would be the Nile. And during this time, he grew very ill. He lost his medicine chest. He got pneumonia. He became dependent, actually, on Arab slavers to take him around the place, although eventually, after a massacre um, in the current Democratic Republic of Congo, in spite of his illnesses, he decided to have nothing further to do with the Arab slavers. And he made it back to Ujiji on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, and was just about to die because he got there, was expecting to found, supp find supplies, but they'd been plundered. Um, and then Henry Morton Stanley, a Welshman who'd left Wales, having grown up in a workhouse, to restart his life in the United States and to become a great journalist, found Dr. Livingstone with the immortal words, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, which he probably never said, but <laughs> made good journalism, on the banks of Lake Tanganyika. And actually, Stanley brought new life to Livingstone. He was about to die, but Stanley had brought huge um, stocks and supplies with him and was able to explore Lake Tanganyika with Livingstone, and together they could rule out living the Tanganyika as the source of the Nile. Stanley tried to get Livingstone to go back to the Britain, um, suggesting that he should restore his health as well as he could, and then come back for a final push on the Nile. But Livingstone refused and went exploring again. Stanley came back to the UK, and in fact, um, Stanley became very friendly with Sir Henry Wellcome. And Sir Henry Wellcome is very important to me because he funds the Wellcome Trust Center for Molecular Parasitology and lots of the parasitology in the United Kingdom. And the reason the Wellcome Trust funds lots of parasitology is that Wellcome himself was fascinated by the tales of Livingstone and Stanley. Wellcome, before becoming a philanthropist, made his money selling drugs. Um, and he actually supplied Stanley with his medicine chests to take into Africa. Um, and uh, so Welcome actually was a pole bearer at Stanley's funeral. They were very, very close indeed. And fortunately for us in tropical medicine, um, Welcome insisted in his will that a proportion of the finance from the Welcome Trust should always be put forward into funding tropical diseases research. Livingstone, however, couldn't be persuaded to go back to Britain. He went back into the swamps down in modern-day Zambia. And he had a huge problem. And the huge problem he had was that although he'd been down to Lake Banguelo before, and he'd made very diligent notes using his um, geographical instruments, his geographical instruments had become broken. 
which meant that when he was aligning himself with the stars, instead of finding all of the landmarks which he believed should be there, they weren't. He was out by miles. His instruments didn't work. He had no way of knowing where he was, so he just roamed from village to village through this kind of swampland, growing iller and iller, until eventually his companions had to carry him, take him to a village, Jitambo's village, where they built a makeshift hut, and it was there on the 1st of May in 1873 that they found him dead, apparently praying on his bed. Whether he was praying or just looking for a position to ameliorate the excruciating agony in which he found himself because during these last months he was emitting a constant stream of blood through his rectum. His intestinal pain was absolutely agonizing. This poor lost man began to realize he probably wasn't anywhere near the source of the Nile. The rivers he was looking at he reckoned may well be the source of the Congo. In fact, that's what they turned out to be. When he died, his companions eviscerated him. His intestines and his heart were buried in Africa, which many see as a very poignant um, phenomenon. And then they, carried, they dried his body in the sun, wrapped it up in a tar-covered um, sheet, and carried him back to the coast for a over a thousand mile walk, put him on a boat to Zanzibar and then back to Britain from Southampton he was taken to the Royal Ge Geographical Society's offices and there he was studied and it was decided in spite of the fact that this mummified body was completely unrecognizable, the arm broken by the lion attack was enough to verify that it was indeed the body of Dr. Livingstone and he was buried in state in Westminster Abbey in 1874. What had killed him? Well, we don't really know what had killed him. He was obviously affected hundreds of times with malaria, he had a gamut of other diseases. Another fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh had recommended that he have his hemorrhoids operated on during his second trip back, um, and Livingston refused, citing that it would be incredibly embarrassing for him if people read in the newspapers that the great Livingstone had been forced to have an operation for his hemorrhoids. So he returned to Africa um, with this condition. I think that he probably died of a disease called schistosomiasis or bilharzia, which is still with us today and is caught in freshwater. Parasites transmitted by freshwater snails produce larvae which will burrow into the skin of people whom they find in fresh water, including Lake Malawi, including Lake Banguelo, including those swamps in southern Africa. And when there, the parasites will mature into adults, and a male and female will couple and copulate unrelentingly, uh, probably not for their entire lives as we had once held romantic <laughs> imaginings that they did, um, but the female will lay hundreds of eggs every day. Some of these will get back into the water to become larvae to reinitiate the cycle. Others will get buried within the liver, the spleen, the lungs, wherever they happen to get to into the body and ultimately cause profound damage in those regions. It's, it's absolutely certain from Livingston's symptoms. Back in the 1850s, he described his um, hematuria, his bloody urine, which is a common um, a common complaint when you're infected with schistosoma hematobian. His uh, hemorrhoids would be another typical feature. And at his death, there was a gigantic blood clot, as his followers described it, which was probably a hugely uh, swollen spleen. So whether he really died of schistosomiasis, we'll never know, but I strongly suspect he did. Another great parasitologist, Robert Leeper, um, has described many different species of the schistosome. He also dominated parasitic helminthology in the 20th century um, from Kilmarnock, educated in Glasgow. And actually, Leeper also showed that the guinea worm, which back in the 70s was infecting millions of people, uh, and which today is actually down to well fewer than 10,000 patients. We're down probably to below 1,000 individuals infected with the guinea worm today. Leeper had shown 
that the guinea worm is transmitted by these water fleas. And again, it's a fantastic discovery because water fleas, you don't need drugs. You can just get a pair of old stockings and filter water through a pair of old stockings, if you like, to get rid of water fleas. So it's so easy to get rid of water fleas that with a correct public health campaign, it's been possible to bring guinea worm to the verge of eradication. And at the moment, the race is on between guinea worm and polio to be the second disease after smallpox that mankind has managed to eradicate. Last year in London, the Declaration on Neglected Tropical Diseases was made, led by uh, the World Health Organization, this is Margaret Chang, and also the influence and cash of Bill Gates, who is putting an awful lot of money into neglected tropical diseases at the moment. And the London Declaration on Neglected Tropical Diseases uh, has involved all of the large pharmaceutical companies, a number of smaller pharmaceutical companies, and also the Department for International Development, along with Gates and the World Health Organization. And it's a pledge to provide the drugs which are active against neglected tropical diseases free of charge with timelines to try to get control, elimination, or eradication of a number of these diseases. And the hope is that by 2020, with existing tools, we will get rid of guinea worm. We may get close to getting rid of leprosy, lymphatic filariasis, trachoma, African trypanosomiasis, or sleeping sickness and bring the incidence of things like schistosomiasis, river blindness, some of the other helminthiases, Chagas disease and leishmaniasis to controllable levels by 2020. So there's been a fantastic sea change in how we are trying to get rid of these neglected tropical diseases, which I think rather tragically are still with us today in spite of the fact that back in Livingston's time, he was able to recognize the importance of those diseases and it would be a fantastic um, a fantastic tribute to Livingstone if we could really begin to get a handle on those. So many people ask me who in the modern era could we think of as being most like Dr. Livingstone? And I think there's nobody. But if we look at a group of people, we can see that his abilities as a naturalist are very similar to David Attenborough today. So Attenborough has had the benefit of television, and anybody who saw the great Africa series that he put on earlier this year would probably be as amazed as I was to see giraffes knocking one another over with their long necks and so on and so forth. But back in Livingston's time, his books were the equivalent when he was describing these fantastic scenes. But he was also an explorer. And remember, the Africa he was looking at was a bit like a moonscape. So perhaps as a pioneering explorer, Livingston could also be likened to somebody like Neil Armstrong. He was also a preacher and a human rights activist, perhaps a bit like Martin Luther King. So I don't think there's any single person in the 20th century to whom we can relate Livingston, but a collection of people. And I think that's an extraordinary outcome of a mill boy from Blantyre whose 200th birthday we celebrate today. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you agree with me that's just an amazing story, or an amazing series of stories. Um, you know, the dramatic story of Livingston himself rising from a very poor background to becoming a very influential figure in medicine um, and in, in tropical disease and exploration and geography and observation of quite remarkable standing. But the, the, the list of truly amazing Scottish um, explorers and parasitologists and medical people is quite remarkable. And I have to say that I found that um, uh, Ross, I think it was Ross, Ronald Ross, left me feeling right a, le a real wimp, actually. <laughs> I mean, his achievements in sport and medicine and exploration and science and everything were quite remarkable. So now we can have some questions to Mike. Um, who would like to begin? Uh, please give your 
name and uh, speak into the microphone and try to keep the questions short. Right. You mentioned the problem, sorry, Graham Crookshank, not a scientist, a historian. Uh, you mentioned the, the problems of the Zambezi campaign and how Livingston had gotten given the British public certain assurances. Now, this was alluded to in a BBC documentary last year in the Exploring series by Neil Oliver, who was uh, very critical on this point and indeed used words like lies and liar. Now, there might be an element of truth in that, but do you think that judgment was altogether too harsh? I think it, I think certainly Livingston exaggerated the ease with which benefits would be accrued from coming into that part of the world. But I think he exaggerated it for arguably reasonable reasons. He, he, didn't, he did miss the Kebrabassa Rapids, which were the, ultimately the reason that you could not navigate the Zambezi in the way that he'd hoped to. The situation with regard to famine and the spreading cholera epidemic from the northern east coast of Africa was something he couldn't have known about. But the spread of that cholera epidemic and the displacement of people, the increasing enslaving, all of these things he hadn't been able to predict based on his previous visit to the, to the region. So I think he messed up. Um, I think he exaggerated, but I think he exaggerated not necessarily because he was a liar. I think he exaggerated because he was, um, he was actually a manic depressive. And there's a fantastic biography that's out of print by Oliver Ransford that describes his um, cyclothamia. But during his optimistic moments, he was of the opinion that nothing could stop what he believed should happen. And of course, that was tempered by very dark moments when he was less able to articulate what he thought should happen. But I think Livingston genuinely believed that the colonization of the highlands of the Zambezi was plausible, credible, and he was profoundly disappointed when it didn't happen. So I'd say overly optimistic exaggeration would be the word I would use rather than downright lie. Next question. Anybody else? Yes. Here we are. My name is Andrew Roberts uh, from SERS in London. I'm a historian of Africa. And I wanted just to point out that Livingston ought perhaps to take credit for one area in which he was not a scientist. That is to say, he did not dis subscribe to the orthodox beliefs and theories of the anthropologists and ethnologists of his day, uh, who for the most part, uh, I think have justifiably been called pseudo-scientific racists. And one of the people, one of the explorers who very much went along with that school of thought, believing that there were different species of humanity, was in fact Richard Burton, whose books, uh, whose uh, account in particular of uh, crossing East Africa, his search for the Nile with Speak, is full of fascinating descriptions. Uh, but his attitude to Africans is very, very different mm -hmm. uh, from that of Livingston. Mm -hmm. uh, Livingston perhaps was not terribly good at social analysis, uh, and certainly part of the troubles of his Zambezi expedition, I think, can be put down uh, to his uh, lack of what you might call political flair, both in dealing with, well, particularly, of course, dealing with his uh, own fellow members of the expedition. Uh, but I think that at least, uh, as I say, as a student of humanity, uh, he deserves credit for not adopting any of the current scientific systems. I absolutely agree with that, and Darwin too was 
outraged with the whole notion of these people who are going around measuring skulls of people they considered of different species to try and put some scientific founding on those ideas. I'd also say that actually Burton has his portrait on permanent display in the National Portrait Gallery in London in a room of the Victorian explorers where Livingston doesn't have his portrait on permanent display. And if anybody else wishes to send a postcard to the National Portrait Gallery asking what on earth they're thinking of, then I think they've got pictures of Livingston down in their archives and it seems to me absolutely outrageous that his isn't the biggest portrait in the Victorian explorers gallery um, where Burton has his portrait hung in uh, a very prominent fashion. Next question. Could I ask a question, Mike? Um, a couple of questions. The first one is, bearing in mind that these journeys of exploration were very long, um, almost all of these characters who were involved were deeply committed to the ex expeditions. Um, they were away for a very long time. They were out of contact with the rest of the civilized world. How could they, how did they keep track of the thinking around the, um, the social um, organization, the social structures in Africa, the, the geographical discoveries that they were making, and the, the importance of, for instance, other animals in the spread of disease and vectors in the spread of disease. This is quite remarkable mm -hmm. how that happened. What was the background to the knowledge exchange? Essentially what Livingstone had the Lancet delivered to him when he was stationary, ah. he had the British Medical Journal delivered to him. He would get in whatever... In the middle of Africa? In the middle of Africa. But this would... You can't do that in Largs. <laughs> <laughs> they would admittedly come about a year after publication. So you would get, you'd get these huge sacks of mail, including the letters from correspondents, arriving as a sack at different times of the year. And what would happen is they would be sent... Um, through the regular channels which would be taking mail, for example, to Cape Town for the, for the uh, colonialists down in Cape Town. And then they would look to see, is anybody, Arab traders, European traders, planning on heading north? Okay. And if they were, they would take a sack of letters and they would deposit it at the major villages. So there's a fabulous quote of Livingstone when he's essentially out of his mind. And he's very ill, he's very depressed, and he's imagining, he said he's looking at a tree, and within the tree he just sees faces and bodies of people, and no matter how often he turns his head away and turns it back again, he's got these vivid images mm -hmm. of individuals, and so really he's going out of his mind at this stage on his own. And the greatest thing from that quote is, he says at the end, he imagined himself getting back to Ujiji, which is where eventually Stanley found him, and he was expecting and craving the letters that would come in a sackload from <coughs> Cape Town or Zanzibar. He said he would get there, but dead, and all of the letters that he'd been so longing to read would be to no avail at all. So these, you'd get big sackloads of, of correspondence, and you'd also, Livingstone wrote about 20 letters a day for most of the time, and again would put these into big canvas sacks and give them to Arab traders, say, right, if you're going to Ujiji, take it to Ujiji, and then see if you can find somebody else who's going back to the coast, see if they can take it, and then take it on to Zanzibar and get it sent back to the, to the UK. I'll just say remarkable. Right, any other questions? Yes, in the centre here. This is a, a perhaps a more modern question. I'm Helen Raftopoulos from the Scottish Funding Council, and I, um, since... Uh, Livingston time we've known about quinine and about uh, nets and uh, why isn't malaria on that list of eradicated uh, tropical yeah. diseases? So malaria, Bill Gates has said we're going for eradication again and there was uproar in the tropical diseases community because in the 1950s there was an eradication plan that was put into place and it ended in a dramatic failure and because of the dramatic failure of the campaign that started in the 50s, most people in the malaria world want to think in terms of the best we can do is to control the disease, to keep numbers down rather than eradicate. It's a sort of mark of Gates's ambition that he's put the E word back on the table with regard to malaria. 
The good news is that actually the incidence of malaria has fallen dramatically in the last five or six years in the numbers of death, and not and that's partly because the investments which are going in. There's an organisation based in Geneva called the Medicines for Malaria Venture. They were set up because the pharmaceutical industry realised that if you have to spend a billion dollars to develop a drug, you're never going to get a return on developing drugs for diseases which afflict predominantly the world's poorest people. Mm -hmm. But nobody was very comfortable with that, including the pharmaceutical industry, but they are an industry, not a charity. So really, over the last decade, what's happened is there has been a realization that we can't expect a for-profit pharmaceutical industry to make drugs for diseases from which they won't get a return. But we don't want that to be the case. So we've, there are a series of product, product development partnerships, including the Medicines for Malaria Venture. Yeah. And I must say, if you look at their portfolio of drugs which are in the pipeline to come through, it's become very, very impressive. It's become very, very impressive because the investment has been there. The pharmaceutical industry have proven themselves very willing to provide compound libraries, provided somebody will screen them, to help to get compounds made into the quality and quantity that's required for the clinical trials. So although malaria hasn't made it onto the list, it didn't make it onto the list because it's not actually considered to be a neglected tropical disease. Because believe it or not, although Malaria is a neglected disease when we compare it to, say, cardiovascular disease for which the pharmaceutical industry are prepared to, to put money into. There are so many people who have malaria, it's not neglected in the same way as some of those other diseases which are on that list. So the short answer is that malaria is being considered for eradication, but it's not part of the London Declaration because it's... Right. Uh, a bigger disease than those small diseases. Well, I think with that um, really quite encouraging um, description of the, the modern current approach to control and eradication, although the big challenge of malaria still remains, uh, it would be time to ask um, uh, Professor Stephen Blackmore to bring the proceedings to a close by, by proposing a vote of thanks to Michael. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening. Um, well, what a remarkable lecture and covering many areas that I must admit coming here this evening I hadn't imagined might come up. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to propose a vote of thanks. I should say, though, that I've got rather few qualifications for doing that. Um, however, I did teach at the University of Malawi in the late 1970s, and while I was there, one of the things I did was retrace parts of the route of the um, Zambezi expedition, trying to discover again some of the plants that Livingstone and Kirk had described, because believe it or not, many of those plants hadn't been seen in the century and a bit between their visits and, and, and my own many years later. So I have a sort of flimsy connection with the right part of the world, I could say. But I think that what Mike's done this evening has given us all probably a very much better understanding of David Livingston as a scientist. I think for most of us, he's very well known as an explorer. And somehow or other, exploration gets a bit of a bad name and regarded as a bit of boy's own adventure and too much excitement and fun. And I know from my own experiences doing field work that it is indeed a great exciting thing to be able to do. But somehow adventure and exploration these days has lost the value that perhaps could have been placed on it. Um, and his, his missionary zeal, I think, is much better known and maybe is a fairer tribute to, to the man. But I, for one, now very, know very much more at the end of the evening than I did at the beginning about his contributions as a scientist and as a keen observer. And it was really interesting, I think, to learn how Livingston had built on the medical training he received in Glasgow and took that with him on his travels around Africa and the new observations he could make as a result of his trained eye and his way of thinking. Um, it's remarkable too to hear about the people who had influenced and shaped his life and quite striking how many of them had connections back to this society. But I really enjoyed the parallel you drew with the life of Charles Darwin, not an idea I've heard before but really quite incredible that you can substitute one picture and leave the same <laughs> biography standing there and that, that in itself I think is really quite an exciting thought I'm going to take home with me. 
But his discovers, discoveries in geography, I think, are equally impressive. Um, I quite like walking, but I don't think 30,000 miles would be my lifetime result, let alone uh, what I might achieve um, uh, in, in, in remote places. And quite incredible, too, that his scientific uh, eye was taken with him uh, at measuring the height of the Victoria Falls, not just looking in amazement, as I think I would have done. I don't think I'd have got past that to the scientific part. And those are really, I suppose, reflections of a deep training and understanding, and maybe mostly important of all, the observations you spoke about connecting with your own field in, in relation to tropical diseases, of the very first observations of um, arthropod transmission of diseases and the discovery of the importance of the vectors and the complex life cycles of so many of those tropical diseases. Um, I must admit, I didn't know traced all the way back to David Livingston. I think really quite remarkable. And his observations on the tsetse fly as well, equally remarkable. And I, for one, would have wanted his importing of Indian buffaloes to have worked. I mean, that really is a clever idea followed through to the next logical step of implementation. But I suppose what it serves to highlight is um, the point you also made, Mike, about things that evolved together in African continent, the humans, the parasites, the whole complex system of nature there, had its set of interactions, and you could no more import an Indian uh, buffalo than a domestic animal. I was also struck by the, what you told us about Livingston's use of quinine and the fact that he went well prepared and armed to survive and cope with life in Africa. And I must admit that I hadn't known before tonight why it was when I was in Malawi and you saw the countless graves of the missionaries that died with incredible speed after arriving there. Uh, within weeks, um, they, they would be gone, with very few of them lasting out six months or a year. Um, how extraordinary then that they didn't know and hadn't got that instruction that uh, Livingston himself had to prepare themselves and uh, why they didn't take that scientific knowledge with them. Um, that, I think, is really something to reflect on because having paved the way, there was some good advice that could have perhaps gone with him. Um, Mike, I think that your knowledge of his life and your own subject, and in a sense your research is so far from the historical, it's quite amazing to think that you've got that historical side as well. But it's quite clear that your passion for the subject came over and your commitment to making a difference to the daily lives of people who are affected and by a large part are poor people by these diseases that are still an important uh, issue and a ravaging those who live in tropical countries, especially in Africa. I think that's an inspiration to us all, and I think I'm not alone, I'm sure, and feeling proud of the work that's being done by your research group and others to, to actually address these, these issues. These are some of the great challenges we face in the future. So I'd like to close by thanking you on behalf of all of us here for a great lecture this evening. And I'm going to do that in words in the Chewa language that Livingston would have known very well. So I shall say, Zikono Kwambiri. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.